It's a great pleasure uh, to welcome to the Taiwan Expert Series, uh, Professor uh, Huang Changling. Uh, she's a professor of political science at National Taiwan University, where she's been the recipient of an outstanding teaching and an outstanding social service award. She received her PhD from the University of Chicago a couple of years back. She was a Harvard Yenjing uh, visiting scholar and a Radcliffe fellow in residence. Professor Huang is widely known for being one of the foremost authorities on gender uh, in politics in Taiwan. She's written a number of related articles, including recent ones on the impact of gender quotas on the political representation of women and on the competitiveness of female candidates generally. In addition to her scholarly activities, uh, Dr. Huang has been involved in the feminist movement in Taiwan and in the transitional justice movement. Uh, through her leadership in organizations dedicated to these causes. So thank you so much, Professor Huang, for joining uh, this uh, episode of our series. Uh, Taiwan, uh, as you've noted in your publications, is perhaps the most gender equal state in uh, East Asia, with uh, over 40% of the seats in the national legislature held by women. Uh, and it's, you know, it's a place where, you know, even in local politics, your publications point out, great strides have been made. Um, women have become uh, mayors and heads of, of local uh, administrative uh, bodies. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm really um, looking forward to uh, our conversation today. Uh, what would you describe, how would you describe the status of women uh, in Taiwan politics and society uh, in general terms? Yeah. Well, first of all, thank you for the invitation. It's really a pleasure to be here and to have a conversation about Taiwan. And uh, in terms of the women in politics, I think the current status of Taiwan is that Taiwan um, is a leader by some indicators. As you just mentioned that we have a relatively large number of women in politics by the usual indicators of uh, the proportion of women in uh, the national legislature. Uh, we are now over, I think we are currently now over 42%, close to 43%. Um, no other country in Asia, I think especially by Asian standards, uh, no other country in Asia has, uh, uh, has, has had such a high number. I think the only other Asian country that has passed the 40% threshold is uh, timor Leste. yeah. And most of the Asian countries are actually, uh, in terms of the percentage, I think most of the Asian countries are under 30. Yeah. So Taiwan, by that indicator, is, I think, the leader. But unfortunately, um, not very many people know about that, mainly because of our political isolation. So uh, Taiwan data are, are not included in a lot of important international statistics. Mm -hmm. What is your explanation for how Taiwan has made such great strides toward equality of political representation for women. Um, I was talking to someone a couple of days ago um, in the Taiwan's diplomatic service, and she mentioned the importance of uh, education uh, as being a way that <clears throat> women could achieve advancement in society. You probably have different arguments based on your analysis of the political system. I, what would you say are some of the, the factors that have led to Taiwan's remarkable success? Yeah, I think education definitely played a role, but education alone wouldn't work uh, to such extent. Because if we look at the Taiwanese experience from a comparative perspective, then the picture becomes very clear. For example, our neighboring democracies like Japan and South Korea, especially Japan. You know, if you contrast Taiwan and Japan, then you see the importance of uh, institutional design. Uh, Japan, since uh, their women have uh, uh, the suffrage rights uh, in the 90, I think 1946, 1947, mm -hmm. and over 70 years, uh, Japanese women seldom exceed 10, more than 10%, almost never, you know, uh, it's like, I think the only time that the, uh, the proportion of women in Japanese lower house exceeds 10% was probably in, I think it, it was in like 2009. So the, uh, up until now, if you look at the number of Japan, it's always under, uh, you know, 10%. It's very, very low by international standards and even by Asian standards. 
Japan was uh, and was the earliest democracy in in, in Asia, and uh, everybody knows it's a industrial giant, like technology wise, very advanced, and uh, the education level of Japanese women uh, is very high too. However, the the level of women's political participation is very low. But the Taiwan is different. So you know, Taiwan has the education, but the most important thing for Taiwan to achieve the current uh, level of women's representation in politics is because we have gender quotas. And we have a long, very, very long history of gender quotas before uh, gender quota, like a quota, before quota adoption became a global trend since the 1990s. I, I noted that in one of your publications, uh, the first gender quota seems to have emerged in the 1940s. Yes, yeah, it was a, it was actually a very interesting story to tell. I think a lot of people who know about contemporary Taiwanese politics know about the complicated historical political legacies of the Chinese Civil War. Mm -hmm. So contemporary Taiwan actually inherits the, the, a lot of the institutions from the Republic of China in China. You know, Taiwan's official name is still Republic of China. So this is the complication part. But a lot of the institutions, the political and the legal institutions were established uh, in China. And then the, the Republic of China national government brought it to Taiwan, including our constitution. Okay, we are still using, a lot of people might find that uh, unbelievable, but unfortunately constrained by real politics, uh, we are still using the Republic of China constitution enacted in 1946. But after Taiwanese democratization, then we have the amendment. So uh, in the main text of the Republic of China uh, constitution enacted in 1946, there was a clause to have uh, women's reserve seats in all levels of elections. So uh, even before Taiwan democratized in the late, uh, you know, began to democratize in the late 1980s, you know, during the authoritarian time, like between 90, late, 1940, late 1940s and up until mid 1980s, we still had elections, like elections under authoritarianism. So for those elections, we had women's reserve seats. That's gender quotas. And uh, so that's why we had such a long history. So Taiwanese, in terms of institutional design, Taiwanese are familiar with the, the ideal that there are women's reserve seats in politics and in elections. The difference between authoritarian time and the, uh, democracy was uh, the level of the quotas. After democratization, uh, after a series of legal and political reforms, we have elevated the, the quota level and make the quota really works to enhance women's political representation. So that's, uh, and that brought us now here at the current level, yeah. One of the arguments emerging from your work that I found intriguing was that the presence of quotas brings more women into the political system. Yes. It makes women more competitive, uh, yeah. even in uh, elections for which there, there might not be a quota for the, the single member district elections. Can you elaborate on that dynamic? How the presence okay. of quotas then makes women more competitive in general? Yeah. Well, um, that work of mine and also other uh, colleagues from Taiwan who have also worked on this topic from a different angle, uh, I think by now we have quote unquote proved that uh, uh, gender quota really worked uh, to enhance uh, uh, women's uh, representation, not just about the number that has increased, but also about increasing competitiveness. Um, one thing uh, about that, especially for local politics, is because our local electoral system is the so-called uh, single non-transferable vote system. So for our local elections, um, um, the, the system goes in such a way that you have pretty large uh, electoral district and you have multi-member seats. So for political parties, when you have the legal requirement of uh, women's reserve seats, so the political parties will try to capture those reserve seats. And uh, uh, not just one political party will have that incentives, right? All political parties want to capture the reserve seats. So once you have a reserve seat in, uh, in a district, then everybody wants to grab that reserve seat. So everybody would try to nominate a woman. 
And the league cannot just select a woman that has no competitiveness. They have to select women that have real competitiveness. But once these women have real competitiveness, then uh, the picture becomes really interesting because the legal stip stipulation is that for every four elected seats, one must be filled by women. So if a woman is quote unquote naturally elected, mm -hmm. uh, uh, then she is already in, then the, the women's reserve seats do not need to be revoked. You know, do not, do not, I'm sorry, do not need to be invoked. You don't need to use the, the reserve seats. So the most interesting effects of gender quotas in Taiwan that we have observed over the past 10, 15 years is that once you elevate the quota level, you have more reserve seats, then the degree of the reliance on uh, reserve seats to get elected uh, for women actually decrease. So it's like uh, when everybody is competitive and uh, coming in to compete with one another, then actually I also think then the, not only you know women's uh, uh, representation is enhanced, but also I think the, the, the quality for local politics is also improved somehow. Mm -hmm. Undoubtedly. Um, another point that I saw in, in your work is that um, the women who do come through the quota system uh, tend to be better qualified than than men, you know, by by comparison. Yes. Yeah. Uh, they actually, are a superior product in a sense. Yeah. Actually, um, that was a, a reek that I did, I think, a few years ago. Actually, I, I myself was a little bit surprised by mm -hmm. the results. Yeah. yeah, because I was uh, when I did that work, I was trying to use the Taiwanese experience to engage with the quota debate. Because, uh, you know, when, when quota adoption became such a global trend, I think at the beginning of uh, um, the whole academic field, globally speaking, uh, didn't have quote unquote evidence to say that quota will work in a positive way, right? Because uh, most of the countries that adopt quotas were based on normative ideal more, like, you know, it's about equal representation and all this and that. So I was using I was using the Taiwanese data to engage in the quota debate to, to say you know uh, you know feminists actually intuitively know that uh, women actually are not uh, less qualified, but uh, we somehow quote unquote need to to prove to others. So that research actually I compare uh, all these women who are elected through the reserve seats and with those men that they replaced. And uh, compare three, um, uh, I use, I think, three indicators. So creating a composite score. Uh, the indicators about their education level, their social participation experience, and uh, their political participation experience. And then, you know, we can see that uh, actually those women uh, who got elected through the reserve seats actually are uh, equal you know, equally qualified or actually even better qualified than most of the men that they replaced. So uh, in my opinion, I, of course, you know, I hope I'm not at the risk of boasting on my own research. <laughs> yeah, but uh, I myself found that results uh, interesting, yeah. Oh, undoubtedly. No, it's an exciting finding. And I really like how you're placing your work in conversation with global uh, discussions about the importance of quotas and and women's yeah. representation in uh, political systems. Uh, let me let me let me sort of add one quick note about gender politics, mm -hmm. because similar research have been done for other countries. All these other countries have no uh, common cultural heritage with uh, like uh, Taiwan or East Asia or you know cultural wise. We are very very different countries. But the gender uh, politics scholars, the scholars in our field who do women's uh, political representation, uh, quota politics, have all somehow come up with uh, similar works. So <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, I'm now speaking like an activist. You know, mm -hmm. I'm hoping that this uh, group of research would convince uh, all other countries that haven't, you know, done the quota adoptions or haven't come up with a better quota designs to, you know, to do the quota politics. <laughs> I'm, I'm convinced. I, I think this global um, um, body of research is, is definitely onto something. Uh, 
Okay, so Taiwan has achieved tremendous success in achieving representation for women. Do you think that there are obstacles um, that still remain that that should be addressed uh, or challenges yes. women face? Yes, so definitely. Yeah. Um, uh, my current research project actually is about the the, the uh, uh, women's political representation in local councils. Hmm. When you look at the local councils, then the picture actually could become different. You know, even though at the, the level of the national legislature, the level of women's political representation in Taiwan is high, but uh, local councils shows a huge variation. Yeah, let me share one very important aspect, and I recently uh, also write about that. In Taiwan, some of the very, very basic local councils, like, you know, the councils at the very basic levels, um, they, are, they are what we call zero women council. The whole council has no women at all. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't have any women. And some people might wonder, like I just mentioned, we have gender quotas. So somehow, how come those we can we could have councils that have no women at all? Well, that has something to do with the institutional design because I just mentioned that our current regulation for local council is that for every four elected seats, uh, you have you know you need to have one woman at least, like you at least one seat that needs to be filled by a woman. Mm -hmm. But some of the local councils, they have uh, uh, electoral districts that has a small magnitude. So mm -hmm. for example, if a local council has like a two districts and each district only has like three seats, right. then you have no gender quotas at all. So when you don't have any gender quotas, then there is this risk mm -hmm. of not electing any woman. So some of the local councils are like that. So you see a huge variation. And I would say, uh, even though Taiwan has the, in the image of being more gender equal than a lot of other Asian countries, but uh, and th this image is not completely wrong, but also not completely uh, correct or representative because indicators always have the limitations. We, as we, you know, political scientists, we all know that. So if you look at some of the Taiwanese uh, local cultural practice, mm -hmm. and you would still see a lot of hindrance for gender equality. Mm -hmm. And I always like to use the example of uh, property inheritance. Mm -hmm. Taiwanese parents, most of the Taiwanese parents up until today still have the, the practice to leave more property to their sons than their daughters. And uh, that is so deep rooted in our patriarchal tradition. And even though the law made it very clear that the daughters and the sons have the same, um, you know, inheritance rights, but, uh, you know, it's very, very difficult to change uh, human behavior. Yeah. The thing, the, the situation has become a little bit, um, you know, gradually become better and better. But uh, the, the practice, I would say, is still quite, some of the cultural practice, like the property inheritance, is still quite resilient. Mm -hmm. mm, that's fascinating. Uh, I, one more question, not to you know, uh, make um, the situation in Taiwan seem like there's, there's so much more work to do, but one question related to an article that you wrote about the Me Too movement in Asia. Uh, yeah. and, you know, someone interested in Taiwan politics, as well as the rest of East Asia, I was curious to, to look at how Me Too has played out in Taiwan. Uh, it has played out, you know, in, in other countries, as you pointed out in the article. Uh, in China, it, it ruffled uh, feathers. We're still talking about Peng Shui uh, and uh, yes. her uh, unfortunate circumstances uh, and media interviews that she's given um, recently during this um, politically sensitive time. Um, but you, you pointed out that um, that Taiwan didn't have a, a similar sort of blossoming of yeah. of <clears throat> of the Me Too movement. Uh, have you have you thought about that further, uh, and and why that is the case? Is the culprit the, the, uh, the public perceptions of the media, or are there other factors uh, here? Well, uh, actually, I yeah, I uh, as you mentioned, I I wrote about that in that short essay about why Taiwan uh, didn't have a Me Too movement. I think, you know, if you look at Me Too, uh, Me Too actually is about very prominent women 
against very powerful men at the beginning of Me Too, you know, when New York Times and the New Yorker broke the, those stories, that's the picture that we saw. And this uh, uh, nature of Me Too, uh, I think, was pointed out by some gender studies scholars already. And uh, um, so for, for prominent women to take such a risk, uh, against a very powerful man, um, you really need uh, uh, quality journalism mm -hmm. to uh, do the verification to make sure that uh, uh, you know uh, the whole the the whole thing will not become just a uh, he said she said mm -hmm. uh, story. Yeah, because if the if the picture is like a he said she said, then women would not usually would not get the justice. Mm -hmm. um, so at the very beginning, I think the Me Too actually could sort of like become uh, a, a global phenomenon. The, the, the very beginning, like, you know, you have you know, really um, uh, uh, like a heavy weight to quality uh, journalism like a New Yorkers and uh, New York Times um, that sort of like make, make people feel that uh, they can trust such a report. And then it became a global trend. Uh, in a lot of countries, I think uh, 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 journalism actually played a very important role. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, uh, the quality of Taiwanese journalism, um, well, for various reasons, um, does not play such a role. So in Taiwan, you, uh, we have, I would call it like a small uh, preludes or small waves of me similar Me Too things before the global Me Too movement uh, came up. But uh, we have never experienced a, a Me Too moment or Me Too wave or Me Too movement like, for example, South Korea. If you look at it, the South Korean experience, it was, I would say, incredible. You know, all these powerful men in various fields, including politics, mm -hmm. uh, were brought down. And of course, that also created other uh, effects because now you, you, you do see a gender war going on in South Korea. But in Taiwan, we have never had that. Yeah, so I think it has something to do with the, the fact that our journalism, um, unfortunately, uh, the quality of Taiwanese, the contemporary Taiwanese journalism just uh, um, somehow failed to shoulder this kind of responsibility. Yeah. Your work is so fascinating. Uh, I'm, oh, thank I'm, you. I'm You're so very, much. very kind. I'm learning so much uh, from from uh, each of these questions. One question I ask people who participate in this series is, can you point the way forward toward interesting research topics that uh, graduate students or maybe other scholars interested in working on Taiwan might pick up? Uh, what stones do you see as, as unturned at this point? I think there are a lot of uh, uh, um, interesting research questions wait for us to explore, yeah. Um, I once joked with one of my colleagues that I say we should just, you know, uh, create a list of all these interesting research questions for students to take, but then that will defeat the, the education purpose, right? Because we always wanted the students to come up with the research questions to help them to do that, because that's the most important part. You don't right. want to just give uh, uh, the students uh, research questions. But in terms of research directions, I think uh, uh, for for like you know women's player representation or participation in Taiwan, uh, we still have a lot of uh, uh, important questions to ask, and uh, there are still a lot of interesting phenomena that uh, require, I think, explanations. Let me just share several with you. For example, a lot of people know that uh, in terms of post-war Taiwanese politics local factions are very important. We have all these, you know, locally established political families. And these uh, factions or families are still dominating Taiwanese politics. However, with gender quotas coming along, so you started to see the interesting effects that uh, all these families or local political establishments, they just allow their daughters or, you know, their, you know, women family members or women faction members to take over the resources. 
So whether you know these women behave more like their brothers and fathers, like you know those local politicians, or they behave a little bit more, you know, like what we would expect a woman's uh, uh, a women's political participation or women's uh, politicians will behave. That's interesting questions to ask, right? And uh, we have not had uh, um, enough research to answer uh, those questions. Also, Taiwan, uh, there is a topic that I myself has been talking about all the time. Some of my friends are tired of me talking about it, but I haven't come up with uh, a good research design about that topic. So I would like to sh take this opportunity, take advantage of this opportunity to share with everybody, you know, like whoever is interested in Taiwanese politics. In Taiwan, we have a southern city. It's called Jiayi. Mm -hmm. This city has been ruled by a woman a mayor for more than four decades. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think it's, it will be interesting to look at, you know, that city's uh, like a governance records and to see whether, you know, a city has a long tradition of ruled by a woman it will be different from other counties and the cities. Um, that city, I think, since um, 1940, late 1940s, mm -hmm. up until now, has only produced one male uh, mayor. And all other mayors uh, were women. And uh, the first several uh, women mayors uh, belonged to the same family. They were like mother and uh, two daughters and uh, their close aides. So it was like a group of women running a, a city. I think it's a really interesting. And uh, I have friends and colleagues who, you know, who grew up in that city. So they were tired of me talking about my interest in that city, but they never really do anything about it. Yeah, but that, you know, that city is a long uh, history is well known in Taiwan. And uh, a lot of people know about that family. A lot of people know about that city, but we haven't really done, you know, there are a lot of reports, but uh, we haven't really done the research and uh, done, uh, I would say, uh, comparative studies, like within Taiwan to compare that city. And uh, that requires research design. And I haven't really come up with a good research design, but I hope one day I would, you know, find time and come up with a good research design to do something about it, because I just think, it's interesting. And I've been asking around, you know, like among the gender studies scholars from other countries, I've been asking around, like, do you have a, you know, case like that, mm -hmm. that I, you know, maybe we could come up with some sort of a comparative work. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Those are fascinating topics. Uh, and I hope uh, that you find a way to uh, carry uh, the torch forward with one or both of those. Uh, uh, those are really, really interesting. Um, thank you so much for your time today. It's such a great pleasure to speak with you. Thank you. Thank you very much.